Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you might be in the world. My name is Martin Viberg. I'm the Principal Software Engineering Group Manager for Java, uh, the Java Engineering Group at Microsoft. That's right, you did hear that correctly. We do have a Java Engineering Group at Microsoft. This is coming to you live from a hot spring evening here in London, UK. Uh, helping me out on the moderator task is Bruno Borge, my uh, Program Manager, Pierre. Uh, he's coming to you live from Vancouver. And we have Asir from Java on Azure also helping out with the Q&A in the background, coming to you live from somewhere in Seattle, I believe. So without further ado, we'll get started. Microsoft and Java have had uh, an interesting history in the past, uh, but as you can see here, we now have a lovely friendly relationship, a happy open source driven T-Rex with Duke, Duke Java uh, sitting on top. They're picking up litter, which is people's programming challenges together as a happy relationship. And uh, I'll dig into some more of Microsoft's investments in Java later on. What I'm going to cover today will be four main topics. Uh, I'm going to talk about how Java has modernized, especially since the days of Java 8, uh, not only in terms of developer productivity, but in the speed of its delivery as well. Uh, we'll be covering how much smaller and lighter that Java has become. And this is aimed primarily at containers, microservices, and cloud environments. We'll cover Microsoft's investment in Java and it's what, it's, what its continued investments will be. Uh, and then last but certainly not least, uh, I will give you a very broad brush cover of how you can run your Java workload on Azure today. Uh, and in the Q&A, if you have specific questions, we have uh, two subject matter experts here with us and Asir and Bruno uh, who can help answer any question you may have. I'll get straight on to the metadata. <clears throat> So, would love to acknowledge the, uh, the interesting times that we live in today. Uh, it's very challenging for many of you right now, working from home, looking after loved ones, maybe having a family at home as well. Uh, my five-year-old is thankfully asleep in his bed right now, but should he wake up due to a dream or something, then we may have uh, an extra voice come onto the channel. Uh, so you have been warned, this is the new normal. I'm going to start by covering modern Java. And I'd like to begin by discussing the good old meme of Java being dead. Uh, for those of you who uh, watch some uh, British uh, humor shows, uh, the dead parrot from the Monty Python sketch is pretty famous. Uh, that's what I'm alluding to here. A again, the tech media has been stating uh, that Java is the next COBOL, it's dying, it's on its way out, uh, and they keep saying this year after year. Um, but the reality is when you look at the numbers behind the scenes and where Java has moved into, uh, the opposite could not be more true. So Bruno helpfully put together a little quiz for you sitting here at home. So this is audience participation time, but uh, virtually and across the globe. Uh, we'd like you to guess how old these languages and ecosystems are. Uh, these three languages are the three most popular languages out there today in terms of jobs, code out there, Stack Overflow, GitHub, those sorts of stats. Um, and it's interesting to see how long they've all lasted for. So we'll give you five seconds. Uh, do feel free to pop in your answers uh, to the Q&A channel, uh, and we'll give out some sort of a virtual uh, Duke Riding a Dinosaur sticker for those who get it right. So we start with Python. Uh, Python has had a massive resurgence of late. It's very popular in the data science and ML space. Uh, you will have seen a lot of talks given uh, around that here at MS Build this week. Uh, it is actually 30 years old, uh, a real veteran of the software industry. JavaScript is the cool new kid on the block, right? Well, that cool new kid on the block is actually now 24 years old. JavaScript has this, uh, this kind of culture, this, this feeling that it is new and fast moving and things. And it, and it still is, right? You have things like TypeScript, with which Microsoft introduced to bring some type safety to the language. Uh, Node.js has come to the fore on the server side. And there's a constant turnover of build tools, packaging systems, so on and so forth. But that said, the core of it, pretty darn old. And Java. Java alongside JavaScript uh, is actually turning 25 this year. Um, it's been around for a long time. It stood the test of time, and it actually continues to... Uh, sit in a top three position uh, in terms of usage. Here is the TOB index from January this year. Uh, again, it shows here that Java is still the number one language according to that particular statistic. It has been in the top three, I think, since the last 15 to 20 years, I believe. 
Um, and uh, we expect it will continue to be in the top three for the next 10, 15 years at least. To give you another data point, we have here the Redmonk statistics, which quite a few analysts see as being uh, somewhat more accurate than Tiobi. Uh, here you have a correlation between uh, questions and tags on Stack Overflow and uh, tags and repos and, and amount of source code on GitHub. Uh, and it's maybe a little bit difficult to see on the screen, but JavaScript and Java are actually piled on top of each other right at the very top right-hand corner there with uh, Python, PHP, and C Sharp coming in pretty closely behind. Uh, again, this was from just Q3 last year, showing again that uh, Java is still incredibly popular and continues to grow. So I'm now going to cover some of the changes that have been made to Java uh, to sort of demonstrate some of the developer productivity that's come about uh, in recent times. The first thing to note is that Java now gets a new major version every six months, <clears throat> as opposed to every six years, which it seemed like it did in the past. So we're now actually at Java 14, believe it or not. So for those of you who are watching right now who are stuck on Java 8, uh, dare I say it, um, there is an awful lot for you to look forward to. Uh, and I highly recommend that after this talk, you go away, you go to our uh, Microsoft Docs, you search for our Transitioning from Java 8 to 11 guide, and get yourself started. If you're looking for a more risk-free approach as opposed to upgrading every six months, uh, there is the concept of a long-term service release, which all of the vendors together have sort of have a gentle person's agreement that every three years uh, we will have an LTS release. Those versions are Java 8, Java 11, and going forward it'll be every six versions, so Java 17, 23, and so on. I won't read the, read the rest of the detail on the slides, but Java is now fully container aware and it can manage your large and small workloads equally. So where is modern Java used? Uh, it is used way beyond the traditional three-tier web app as it used to be in the sort of mid 2000s, early 2010s. Uh, it's used incredibly now in the big data space. All of your popular Apache projects that you have which shunt vast amounts of data around and, and compute on it uh, are all JVM based. Amazon relies on it uh, almost 100%. Google uses it a ton internally, and surprisingly, we do as well. And I'll cover that with a slide later on. Java, ever since Java 7, has been completely free as in use. It is GPL v2 license. It is also free as in bear, as long as you are grabbing a, an open JDK distribution from a vendor of your choice. Uh, for example, on uh, Azure, we partner with Azul System, and we provide you Zulu Enterprise uh, for with commercial support for free uh, when you come and run your Java workloads on Azure. Another thing to point out is the uh, VS Code support that we now have. So there's Java extensions for VS Code. Uh, it's perfect if you are sort of a lightweight uh, microservices full stack developer and you're doing you know, a little bit of JavaScript on the front end, maybe some React. Uh, you're talking to a back end Java service. Uh, VS Code uh, really helps you out in that situation. It's a lovely, lightweight editor to use. <clears throat> On the developer productivity side of things, uh, the little number in the top right-hand corner tells you which version of Java this feature came into. So I'll begin with var. Uh, a big complaint about Java has been about its boilerplate uh, source code, uh, that you have to do an awful lot of type typing, uh, pardon the pun, uh, in order to uh, get your business logic out. Uh, we now have the var keyword, which, uh, thanks to some fantastic type inference, means you no longer need to have that boilerplate on the left-hand side. It completely understands what the right-hand side is and what's being assigned to it. And your variable names now come to the fore. So when you're reading your source code, your business logic in the, in the source of your variable names really comes out to the reader, comes out to you as the programmer. As long as you're not using single character names for your variable names, uh, this is going to be of great benefit just for that alone. Here's a shout out to Bruno, who's watching as moderator. Bruno uh, famously loves YAML. You can uh, see him on Twitter um, constantly talking about how much he loves it. Um, and uh, now with Java, uh, Bruno, amongst other developers, can actually pretty print. He can format that YAML inside his Java should he need to. Same goes for JSON, XML, Markdown, any of those type of things. 
we now have switch expressions in Java. So like all languages, uh, we've had a switch statement for a very long time. Uh, that's worked very well. Uh, but having the power of being able to switch over an expression really broadens the kind of use cases you can use here. Uh, and there's some, some more advanced pattern matching uh, use cases that are coming soon as well. You can also see here that you're now allowed to put in a little bit of business logic in a case block and you can then yield the result. Yield is a reserved keyword in Java, which is now being utilized for this. Here's the big one, records. Records are coming in at 14. They're being improved in 15, which is coming out around the September. And the idea of records is to give you uh, effectively a tuple or a struct-like uh, structure in Java uh, that is still a Java class but without the overhead of a Java object. Uh, that means you don't have all of the metadata and the header associated with these records. It means that records can be packed incredibly tightly together, uh, which really helps with your memory management. Uh, and this is perfect for when you are doing machine learning work, when you're doing graphics manipulation, when you're doing matrix multiplications, and any other sort of heavyweight uh, number crunching. But again, the fantastic thing here, and I think the, the language architects have done a great job, is that you have this idea of a tuple or a struct, but it's named properly, right? You sort of have this domain-driven design going on. I know this thing is a point, and that'll come through in my source code, which is fantastic. Next up, we have the dreaded null pointer exception. This is the thing which you know has irritated educators for many, many years now in Java. Uh, we tell new people to Java that there are no pointers in Java. You don't have to worry about them. They're all references. In the very first error a new Java programmer typically gets is a null pointer exception, which is not very helpful. But thankfully now, if you are chaining a bunch of calls down a call stack, uh, the null pointer exception will tell you where within that call stack the null pointer exception is coming from. So in this particular case, it is the object B in the, in the long call chain of ABCI, which is null, and you are now actually explicitly told that. We now have smarter interfaces in Java. Uh, you can have a default implementation in your interfaces, which may sound a little bit strange, especially because Java has this concept of abstract uh, classes. But what's really going on here is that the, the whole industry has started to shift away from using uh, driving inheritance through polymorphism in the object-oriented languages. Uh, instead, Inheritance uh, by composition is a much more popular uh, and more flexible design choice, and having default implementations available to you in uh, Java interfaces allows you to do that. So those are just some of the highlights. Uh, there's a ton of other features which have been added in Java since, uh, since 8 all the way through to 14, and there's more coming in the future as well, which um, I'll cover off uh, at another time. Java is now also smaller and lighter particularly for cloud, which is fantastic. So, as of Java 9, Java is fully modularized internally, and that means you can package your application code with the tiniest kernel of the Java, what was previously the Java runtime environment, bundle that up, uh, sorry, link those together using a tool called JLink, which comes with Java, bundle it up with another tool called J Java Packager, or JPackager, they sort of have changed the name in different versions, uh, and bundle that as a native installer for the operating system you're deploying to. So in effect, it becomes a native package with the Java runtime embedded in it. So you no longer have to rely on users you know, needing to have a particular version of Java installed. Java is also fully container aware. Uh, if you're on Java 8, please, please, please make sure you upgrade to update 191. Very important. Uh, and that way it will pick up things like the uh, amount of RAM being made available and the CPUs being made available to it by the container and not the underlying host. Java deduplicates strings. So again, if you are Bruno and you love manipulating megabytes of YAML data and it's all duplicated, uh, Java now deduplicates that for you and helps you out, which is fantastic. Um, if you're looking for faster startup time, uh, the class and application data sharing feature caches off some of the metadata after the first run of your application, saves it off in a cache. The next time you start up, it loads that data from the cache and you get a speed up in startup time. Again, it's fantastic for microservices and cloud. 
if you need to do any sort of event streaming, uh, non-blocking, asynchronous, reactive, whatever you want to call it, uh, there are many buzzwords around this style of programming. Uh, Java has this built in since Java 9, uh, as well as the usual host of third party libraries. Java continues to perform better for you out of the box every time you get a new version. Uh, it's had this kind of guarantee ever since Java 4 and it continues to do so. Uh, in particular of interest, we have two sets of garbage collectors which are really well suited for the two complete opposite use cases. One use case is where you're firing up a microservice, you never want your JVM to pause because of a garbage collection, and you know your JVM is not going to stick around for very long, so you don't want to do any GC whatsoever. There's a new garbage collector called Epsilon, which is a no-op, so you can select that one, it'll no-op, and you won't have any interference. On the other side, on the other major use case, if you are doing huge big data stuff uh, on big iron and massive terabyte heaps, uh, there are two options for you now. Shenandoah and Zero GC, otherwise known as ZGC, uh, offer you the ability to manage these incredibly large heaps. They have these really efficient concurrent algorithms under the hood, uh, which means that you will not get these really long JVM pauses for these large heaps. So that problem, in its essence, uh, goes away. There's a host of modern features coming through in Java 15 Plus uh, via projects Loom, Valhalla, and Panama. Uh, as an example, we'll have things called lightweight threads. Uh, some of you might think of these as coroutines. Uh, there's going to be better interop with native code, so on and so forth. <coughs> so I've just covered off uh, how Java internally has changed in particular, so it can run really, really small in cloud and container environments. And now I'm going to talk about Microsoft's investment in Java. So first of all, the bit that surprises most people, and, and the bit that really surprised Bruno and I when Bruno uh, first started uh, with me in our group uh, late last year, and, and we surveyed the entirety of Microsoft internally and, and had a look at what Java was running there. Um, some household names immediately pop up. LinkedIn, uh, Minecraft for the kids or kids at heart, um, and Java is embedded in SQL Server. So Microsoft depends really heavily on Java throughout. Uh, and so, as of a couple of years ago, it started to give back. Uh, and very recently, we signed the Oracle Contributor License Agreement for OpenJDK. That's the source code behind Java itself. And uh, our Java engineering group now contributes patches and fixes and, and updates to Java itself. Uh, we also uh, support Adopt OpenJDK. This is the vendor-neutral, uh, most popular OpenJDK distribution. Uh, so if you're looking for uh, a distribution which is supported by Red Hat, Microsoft, Amazon, Azul, and a consortium, IBM, a consortium of others, uh, that's a good choice to go for, especially if you're on-prem. We're also a strategic member of the Eclipse Foundation, uh, where a lot of forward-looking Java uh, libraries and frameworks are currently live, such as Jakarta EE, MicroProfile, and a whole host of IoT libraries and frameworks. Microsoft last year bought a Java company, uh, which was a very strange thing to see. Uh, I was delighted about this. Um, uh, full disclaimer, I was the CEO of JClarity. So myself and my team came across. We bought some machine learning based uh, anal uh, performance analysis tooling and a whole bunch of expertise uh, in and around OpenJDK. We've gone and hired on top of that with some industry names that you might recognize, such as Monica Beckwith and Kirk Pepperdine. And uh, we're off and running and contributing back to Java, which is fantastic. Azure Spring Cloud is a major, major service that uh, Microsoft has now built. Uh, Asir, who's on the Q&A behind the scenes, had a large part to play in this. Uh, Spring is the most popular web framework uh, that we use today uh, out there in the Java ecosystem. Really dominates the market there, probably 50 to 60%. Uh, and we now have a first class uh, platform as a service solution for you. So you can bring your Spring code directly to Azure, pop it into our Spring Cloud, and off you go. That's in preview today. Uh, so you can go check that out immediately. There's a whole bunch of other tools uh, that we're involved in uh, in and around for Java developers. So obviously GitHub with its packages, security advisories, uh, code navigation and so on, all, all has Java backed in it. Visual Studio Code I mentioned before has a whole bunch of Java extensions which are really popular. Uh, we have Java embedded, of course, in SQL Server uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, quick shout out to the Windows subsystem for Linux, WSL, uh, it's proving to be somewhat of a revolution. Lots of people are trying it out. Uh, I recommend you give it a go. It uh, certainly beats Sigwin. 
Last but not least, I'd like to cover off how you can run your Java workloads in Azure, and you can do so today. So Microsoft really has spun up a lot of first-class services in this space. And you can bring any type of Java workload. If you've got a traditional monolith sitting on a bigger bit of big iron, it's on an old version of Java, you're not 100% sure about where all the libraries and stuff all came from, but you know you can bundle it all together and shift and lift it, then come bring it to our IaaS platform. Stick it on an Azure VM, get all of the security and storage benefits, get connectivity to data stores such as SQL Server, get logging and monitoring and tracing and all that good stuff. Uh, if you are on the other end of the scale, you're writing your 12-factor apps, uh, event sourcing everything, it's all microservices, and you're using Istio and Kubernetes and all those good things, uh, then we've got a home for you here as well. So here is good old Duke. He's popping in various flavors of your Java application into the hopper. And whether you're migrating or building a new Java application, uh, we have options for you in the IaaS space. We can do container platform as a service with Red Hat's OpenShift or our uh, AKS, our Kubernetes service. Uh, we have full platform as a service with Azure App Service with Tomcat, Manage Tomcat, the Spring Cloud I mentioned before. Whatever you're bringing to the table, uh, we can manage it for you and we can help you modernize uh, after you bring it over. Here is a incomplete list, uh, but uh, a, a good coverage of the uh, Azure services we have for Java today. Uh, I think I've talked about a lot of these already, but note we have no SQL options there, a variety of SQL options. We have the event and service bus for all of your event streaming, uh, and the rest is, is all the typical Azure stuff you would expect to see. Again, I'd like to mention Spring Cloud. This has proven already to be really popular in preview. We've got several customers running it, uh, running their production workloads on it. We partnered with Pivotal on this, uh, so it really is the first class experience from the people behind Spring itself. Uh, and again, don't have to make any code changes, just bring your workload over. Behind the scenes, uh, running all of this under the hood, uh, we currently partner with Azul System to supply the Java runtime environment. Uh, we use Azul's Zulu, and you can see there at the bottom that uh, we have commercial support until March 2030 for 8, 2027 for Java 11, and that is at least, right? So that is kind of the minimum bar we are setting and we're sort of following along with the rest of the Java community there. Um, so be rest assured, you'll have free commercial support for as long as you need it with Azure. There's a little bit more, uh, your log streaming, all the kind of non-functional stuff that you would want to have uh, is all there as part of Azure's cloud. Um, and so you can bring your own Jenkins as an example, or you can use Azure DevOps. All the event sourcing stuff is there, as I mentioned before and we support all the popular build tools out there. So with that, I will quickly wrap up with a conclusion. If there are four things that you can take away from this talk, uh, is that first of all, Java has been modernized. Uh, there's a lot of wonderful Java, uh, developer productivity stuff in there. Java now really excels at running in really small packages on the cloud, so you can really use it for your function as a service or your tiny microservices. It's small, it's fast, it's lightweight now. Microsoft has uh, seen all of this. It is investing heavily in Java. It's building some amazing Java services on Azure. Uh, we've spun up the Java engineering group to contribute directly back to Java. Uh, and of course, you can bring your Java workload to Azure today. And if you have direct questions on that, please drop them into the Q&A. So with that, I will say thank you. Uh, there is a recording link there on the, on the slide deck. Our Twitter handle is Java at Microsoft. You can see the dinosaur and our Java blog as well. I will now hand over to Bruno for Q&A. All right, thank you, Martin, so much for this. Uh, we do have a few questions here. Uh, let's start with one about this new language feature called records. Uh, Gabriel is asking, are records immutable? Uh, records immutable. Uh, I'll have to drum the roll this one back in my head as to what the latest implementation is. Yes, I believe the intent is that they are effectively final and therefore they are effectively immutable. Uh, but what I'll do is I'll follow up uh, on Twitter with a confirmation of that. All right. Um, is Microsoft supporting both Oracle JDK and OpenJDK? It's, uh, so Microsoft is officially uh, will support uh, any Java runtime that you wish to bring to Azure, but our officially supported runtime is Azul's uh, Zulu which is uh, OpenJDK. It's Azul's wrapper around OpenJDK effectively. Uh, and it's fair to say that with Microsoft's strategic uh, vision about supporting open source and being a good player in the open source community, 
uh, that will continue to heavily support uh, OpenJDK uh, derivatives going forward. Yeah. Uh, this one is interesting. Is Microsoft using Java instead of C Sharp or C++ to develop some Azure services? That is a great question. Uh, as appropriate, uh, yes, it is. We actually have a surprising amount of number of Java engineers internally here at Microsoft. And for the appropriate service, if Java is the right language to choose, then uh, it, it now can really be chosen as, as a first class citizen. Perhaps maybe five years ago in the past, there wasn't that much expertise internally at Microsoft to, to make that choice. But if that choice needs to be made, it now can be, yes. Awesome. How with the uh, this new Oracle Java licensing for their commercial uh, version of Java, how can one install Java at Microsoft? I guess maybe this question is coming from a Microsoft employee. We don't know. Uh, again, we uh, recommend that you go for the Azul Zulu Enterprise Edition that comes free as part of uh, of your, your Azure subscription, as long as you're running a Java service. Um, if you are sort of a little bit more curious and you want to install something at home maybe or on-prem, uh, again, you can still go with Azul Zulu. Uh, the other popular choice out there today is Adopt Open JDK. Okay. And, and both of those are free as in bare and free to use. Yeah, it's important to say that if if developers want to bring, for example, Red Hat OpenJDK to run on Red Hat Linux, on Azure VMs or Azure containers, they can definitely do that, and we will make the best of uh, the best possible to make it work, just like any other Java distribution. And Absolutely. we do have connections with Red Hat, and to really help make it work the best possible way. Mm -hmm. um, the question I got here was. Are, are we also looking at better Kotlin support, for example, for Azure Functions? Oh, that is a great question. So I personally do not know if there is anything on a roadmap to do with Kotlin. Uh, we will go away, Bruno, myself, and Alistair can go away and dig into that a little bit further. And if there is something to share, you'll see it shared publicly. Yeah. What I can add about this question is that um, Kotlin allows Kotlin is a language that can run on top of the JVM. So you can write Kotlin code. You can do even Spring Boot applications written in Kotlin and deploy just a normal Java application on top of the JVM. On Azure Functions, same thing goes. You can write an Azure function using Kotlin and deploy on Azure Functions. In fact, there is a Maven archetype on, on our GitHub organization that helps you set up a Kotlin-based Azure Function project. So give it a try, let us know how it works, and uh, uh, send feedback over uh, the GitHub repo or on Twitter. Uh, happy to help. And we can also share that for one of the tools we use internally in our Java engineering group, uh, it is actually written in Kotlin, and it's, it's well supported by our, our engineers there. So it is, it is understandably a fairly popular language for some of the benefits it brings. Yeah. One other question I got here. Are there options for custom Maven repositories on Azure? Custom Maven repositories on Azure. Now, I know that Azure DevOps uh, supports Maven repositories. Whether or not it gives the end user the capability of setting up their own custom one is a question. I That is one I do not actually have an answer for off the top of my head, I'm afraid. Yeah, well, it, it is. Uh, last year, we saw an announcement from GitHub, uh, GitHub package repositories, where you can enable a package repository to host Maven artifacts. But they have Maven support. So you do that, you have that functionality on GitHub, and you also have that on Azure DevOps. I think the specific feature is called Azure Artifacts, and you can enable a Maven feed uh, to publish your Maven um, artifacts and then integrate whether on Gradle or Maven, and it should just work. For example, it's hosting your private projects that you don't want to put it out there in Maven Central. So. Uh -huh. So we do have that capability um, supported really well. Oh, that's um, really good to know. Uh, what version of Java sh do we recommend for a new project made today? Made today. So my personal recommendation is that if you are if you're a little bit risk adverse, I would start with Java 11. Uh, if you're a little bit more comfortable with being on the leading edge, then there's no reason why you shouldn't go for Java 14. Yep. And last question, do we have support for uh, app servers like uh, Pyara and Wildfly on Azure? Uh, yes, we do in different, in different ways, though. So uh, we don't have them all as a platform as a service. Uh, 
but you can certainly bring those workloads to Azure and run a Pyara or a Wildfly server in one of our uh, either container solutions or on one of our VMs. Awesome. All right, Martin, thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for uh, sending your these great questions. And I hope to see you soon on the interwebs. Have okay. a great day. Thanks all.